Okay, well, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's been a, my first time here at the National Academy as well, and uh, if nothing else, I, I will promise you that I will be on time uh, because my flight board's in an hour. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so I've had a, my lab uh, now for about four years at the New York Genome Center, and we're, we're very interested in some of the problems that I'm going to talk to you about today. So I think we've heard a lot today about really fantastic applications of, of single-cell RNA sequencing in particular, but we've also heard glimpses of other technologies which can be extremely powerful. Uh, and I think that's one, one of the things that's made the last year so exciting is the, the breadth of, of the different types of measurements that we can make from single cells. Not just looking at the transcriptome, but also, for example, looking at things like single cell attack seek uh, or site seek, which is a technology we've introduced at the New York Genome Center to measure proteins and RNA at the same time uh, in single cells. Uh, or even technologies like StarMap, which is from Gary Nolan and Carl Deseros' lab, which is an in situ spatial technique to be able to measure thousands of genes, but to know where each molecule and each cell is located. So what, what excites me about all these different technologies is that each one of them tells us a different aspect of cellular identity. Right, so, so single cell RNA is great for sort of clustering cells and telling us, well, this cell sort of matches in cluster A and cluster B, but it doesn't necessarily tell us very something deep about the biology of the cell. For, for that, we might want to look at something like single cell ataxy to understand the chromatin landscape and accessibility and regulatory information, or site seek to understand a cell's immunophenotype so we can do enrichment experiments, or a cell's spatial location and interactions. Right? Those, are, those are the things which are going to deeply govern its biology, not just its transcriptome. So the challenge, though, is that each of these technologies is a separate experiment, and, and so we can learn quite a bit by analyzing these data sets one at a time. Uh, but I think one of the biggest challenges and also one of the biggest opportunities in, in the data analysis of, of single cell genomics is to be able to have these experiments inform each other, is to be able to integrate these, these experiments uh, into a single analysis so that the information from one can help us interpret the information in another. And that's this problem of integration that I'm going to be focusing on today. seem to be stuck. Yep, I'm doing the big green button. Oh, yep, there we go. Uh, okay. Uh, big green button. Okay, there we go. Uh, so, so last year, uh, my lab and, and John Marioni's lab put forward a, a first set of techniques uh, to try to integrate uh, different single cell RNA seq data sets together. Uh, and actually, what I'm going to tell you about today is a, is a new method uh, that. And if, but if you know these papers, you'll you'll recognize uh, elements both uh, in both of them in, in our in our new technique. And and so the work that I'm going to tell you about uh, really has been done by by four people in the lab: Andrew Butler, who's a PhD student; uh, Tim Stewart, who's a new postdoc. Paul Hoffman, a software engineer, and Christian Meyer, who now has his own lab at Max Planck. Uh, and in a series of papers, we've worked on this problem of integration. And, and really what I'm going to be telling you about is our newest method, which is, which is currently available on, on, on BioArchive and also on GitHub. Okay, so, so I'm going to start with a very basic example uh, of this problem of multiple different technologies. So, uh, you know, a few years ago, there were basically four studies that all came out at around the same time in the literature. And it was four groups that each decided they were going to do single cell profiling of human pancreatic islets. And so all of them basically, they basically ran on the same type of, of tissue. Uh, but they used four different technologies, and it was four different labs on different continents and different sequencing uh, uh, instruments and everything. So, so it was kind of comforting that if you look at these experiments one at a time, they do seem to overall discover the same cell types. So that's good. But we thought, what if we can pool all of these four studies together into a, into a single analysis? Maybe we can learn something new if we, if we can sort of look at all the experiments together. And what winds up happening, as you might expect, is you get basically an enormous mess. So if you take all of the cells from all the different experiments, what winds up happening is the cells cluster both by their underlying biological cell type, but also by their, tech, oops, also by their technology of, of interest. And you get this kind of mess that's very, very difficult to analyze because you can't distinguish a biological cell type from a batch effect. And what we need to be able to do is to be able to design methods, and first I'm going to show you the answer, then I'll show you how we do it, where we can basically group cells first by their shared biological state across technologies, and then we can go back and we can ask what's different of the, in between the alpha cells, which is all these technologies, and, and the beta cells. So when, we, when my group started thinking about this problem, we, we thought about, uh, we, we call this alignment of data sets, because it reminds me of a problem I worked on in my PhD, which was sequence alignment. If you want to understand what's different between two genomes, you first sort of anchor that alignment based on what's the same, and then you can go back and explore differences. And I think we need the same sorts of tools for, for single cell analysis here. Of course, after we align these data sets together, we can do a single 
single clustering analysis, we basically have a, a beautiful combined harmonized data set for which to discover cell types and cell states in the pancreas. And, and I'll just point out here that when we do this, you can see how sharp the, this plot is compared to what we saw before, how much easier it is to separate these cell types because we have so many more cells. We have so much more statistical power to separate cell states uh, and also to find rare uh, groups of cells that we never would have been able to find in any individual experiment. Okay, so, so how do we actually do this? And I'm just gonna try to give you some intuition basically for how this works rather than too much mathematical detail. So what I'm showing you here is a scatter plot of two genes. Uh, each dot here is a cell in the four data sets, okay? And, and what you can see is that the raw numbers of these genes are very, very different from technology to, to technology. So for example, in the fluid IMC1 data set, you have a lot of zeros here, right, in this gene GCG, a lot of dropout events. Uh, the cell C2 data set had deeper sequencing. There we don't have any dropout events at all. So that's, that's a big shift in these raw numbers. That's why it's so difficult to be able to integrate these data sets together. So the raw magnitudes of, of the values are very, very difficult to compare. But what you can appreciate here is that in all four data sets, despite the fact that they're very different technologies, very different cell numbers, the correlation between these two genes is conserved. And the reason the correlation is conserved is because both of these genes are markers of alpha cells. So they're co-regulated, and that biological co-regulation is present in every data set, no matter the technical dropout. And so that, that's, that sort of shared source of variation is what we're going to use to enable us to align these data sets. And my lab has introduced the idea that we can use methods for joint dimensional reduction. So we use canonical correlation analysis, but you can also do versions of non-negative matrix factorization or even uh, variational autoencoders, not just to find sources of heterogeneity like in PCA, but to find shared sources of variation in multiple data sets. And that's basically the basis of how we're going to align these things together. All right, so I'll give you a little bit more, more detail now. So, so this is how our procedure works. We're going to start with two uh, data sets. They have to be single cell, but they don't have to be single cell RNA-seq, but they have to be single cell. They should compare, they should contain some of the, sh the same shared biological populations, but they don't have to, to be completely overlapping. They're, for example, in the query data set here, we have a new population there in black, okay? So we're going to start by running canonical correlation analysis, like I just mentioned. And what that's going to do is it's going to find shared sources of variation and project these data sets into a shared underlying biological subspace. What we're going to do then is we're going to identify mutual nearest neighbors in this L2 normalized space. Mutual nearest neighbors are sort of like uh, two cells across data sets that are best buddies with each other. So they both each mutually identify each other as their best friend. And when you have that mutual, mutual relationship, that, that really implies that they're from a shared biological state. So when we identify one of those MNNs, we, we, we draw a line between them. And, and you can see that if we draw enough of these lines, we call them anchors, because they basically seem to almost anchor the two data sets together, right? Now, um, if we can draw these anchors accurately, then it's very easy, actually, for us to be able to sort of do the batch correction or integrate these data sets together, or alternatively, for us to be able to transfer information from one experiment to another experiment. I'll show you lots of examples of the sort of transfer of knowledge across data sets. But all of that, of course, relies on the accuracy of our anchors. So I'll highlight that when we draw an anchor, we're making a prediction that two cells across data sets are in a shared biological state. Okay? And so in principle, if there's a cell state that's only present in one data set that's not present in the other, then we shouldn't draw any anchors at all. Okay? That's how this should work. Now, now, this is actually not a cartoon. This is actually a, a real data analysis here. And what I'm showing you is, is every anchor that we draw. And I think it's important not just to show you a cartoon. This is actually how this works. Data is noisy in real life. So you can appreciate a few things here. The first is that the vast majority of anchors that we draw are correct. In this case, we know the biological ground truth, so we can see that they're connecting cells in the same biological state. That's very, very good. But you can also see that we're, we are drawing some incorrect anchors. Those are schematicized here in red. But the last thing that I want to point out is, is you might be able to appreciate that, that we can actually tell which anchors are correct and which anchors are incorrect, even if we don't have the ground truth. And the reason for that is if you look at these incorrect anchors here, in this case originating from a unique cell population in one data set, they're sort of randomly projecting right all over the graph. They're, they're sort of randomly projecting in, an, in a non-consistent way, whereas the correct anchors are all projecting in a very consistent uh, and, and uniform structure. So we can actually use that, that idea uh, to sort of basically weight our anchors and develop a sort of a consistency score that helps us to downweight incorrect edges in a graph. And, and that's actually all inspired by work that, uh, that, that a number of groups have done uh, in, in trying to build graphs on single cell data. 
Okay, so that's just a, a, a basic intuition. There, there's three ideas here that are, that are key to understanding how this works. The first is that we're performing a joint dimensional reduction with canonical correlation analysis to find the shared structure across the data sets. The second is that we're using this mutual nearest neighbor requirement in order to identify these, these stringent correspondences. Uh, and the last is that we're prioritizing robust correspondences by examining the overall structure of the graph. And that gives us a great deal of robustness in the downstream analysis. Okay, so, so let me show you some really fun things that we can do uh, with, with this method uh, up and running. Okay, so, so now what I'm showing you is a plot. Before I showed you those four pancreatic islet data sets integrated together. So now what we did here is we just went to the literature now in 2019 and we looked for every pancreatic islet data set we could find that had been published by any lab anywhere. Okay, and so we found basically I think uh, uh, eight different uh, publications across six different technologies, 25,000 different cells, and it's very, very comforting that we can integrate all of these together again into a unified and harmonized reference. So I really like this sort of paradigm for a couple of reasons. First, this is, I think, one of the key challenges for consortia like the Human Cell Atlas, right? We don't want to build a, a drop-seek cell atlas and a 10x cell atlas. We want to take all the data that's generated from the community in, in the context of a tissue and build one single harmonized list uh, of cell types and cell states, and that's what we're able to do. Do here. The other reason I like this plot is we actually didn't even limit our search to only human data sets. We're actually showing two data sets here, one from Italian Eyes Lab and one from Tabula Miris and Mouse. Uh, so these methods also enable us to match species, uh, cell types that are conserved together across different species. Uh, and actually in, in Dr. Kaminsky's talk that you heard in, in the last uh, uh, session, uh, he actually used uh, an earlier version of our tool uh, in his human mouse comparison. So we're very happy to see uh, that this sort of field of evolutionary single cell biology is being opened up to be able to compare how cell types uh, evolve uh, uh, during, during, during the evolutionary process, and, and that requires computational methods to, to line these things up. So in this case, that actually is real, uh, real alignment. Okay, so before I showed you a slide where we took all the data in the literature from one organ, so now we can extend this across to an entire organism. So, so here we're looking at two data sets produced by the Tabula Muris project at the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. So they did a really cool experiment. They took 21 different tissues from the mouse and they did single cell RNA-seq with two technologies, deep sequencing with SmartSeq2 and, and shallow sequencing with 10x. Uh, and so um, they actually sequenced most of the tissues with both technologies. So it's very comforting that when we integrate the data sets together, we see extensive mixing as we would expect. Um, but you can see a number of blue clouds here uh, that are only blue. And, and those are basically tissues where there weren't very many cells, and so they only were able to run one of the two technologies. So for example, in the, in the gut, there, they only ran cells with SmartSeq and not with 10X, so there's no red cells that sort of align to the blue. And, and so I like this example because it kind of shows what we're going for. On one hand, we want to be able to match cell types that are present even in the, pres in the context of a significant batch effect, but we don't want to force things to align either, right, when they're actually different. Uh, and so this is a nice example of that here. Again, I'll highlight that now that we can pool all these different experiments together and run a single clustering analysis, we have incredible sensitivity to ultra-rare populations that we simply never would have been able to see if we looked at one data set at a time. Let me go through some of those in the manuscript if they're of interest. Okay, we can expand this idea also to humans. So this is a, a data set, uh, actually this is one of the first large scale data sets produced by the Human Cell Atlas and that's now publicly available uh, online. This was generated at the Broad Institute. Uh, and uh, so they, pu they published data, set, uh, data from about 300,000 cells in the human bone marrow uh, across eight different donors. And, and you can see that if we do a standard analysis, uh, we, we, get, we get pretty nice mixing, but there is still some subtle batch effects there. And it becomes a little bit difficult, especially in the T cell populations, to say what's really a new population of T cells and what's a more donor specific effect. So it's kind of nice that we can, we can remove that problem in an integrated analysis. Uh, and when we, when we really analyze all of these cells together, it's just an exquisite data set. So, so thank you to, to Human Cell Atlas, and we're very much looking forward to seeing similar maps across many tissues. But this is really an extraordinary map of the human bone marrow. Uh, you can see our hematopoietic stem cells here in an almost tree-like structure that emerges representing the uh, hematopoiesis. Uh, and of course, extraordinary diversity in the differentiated cells as well, almost 20 different lineages that are represented here. So it's really beautiful data. And it's also very nice data if you were interested, for example, in what genes were to change as you were moving from hematopoietic stem cells to any of these downstream lineages, right? That would, that would, that would be an analysis you could do here. Uh, one other thing that I'll mention is now that we have these, this integration, it becomes very easy for us to ask, well, how do hematopoietic stem cells differ 
across all eight of the donors, or how do myeloid progenitors differ, or how do CD56 bright NK cells differ. But now that we've called cell types in a consistent way across all eight donors, we can do those comparisons very, very, very sensitively and very accurately. Uh, and I won't talk about it now, but, but we see some interesting differences that also correlate with age and gender. Okay, but anyway, what I, what I was saying was that this is a great molecular data set to understand lineage differentiation. The only thing that's kind of missing here, if you're a, a hematologist, and my lab is getting more and more interested in hematology, is it would be really cool if we also knew the surface proteins that were expressed on each of these cells, because, you know, hematologists want to be able to enrich for these different populations, right, not just look at their gene expression. And so when we think of that, we, we, we thought of, our, of a technology that I mentioned earlier called SiteSeq, which, which we developed, which enables us to measure protein and RNA molecules at the same time. So if this data set had been generated with SiteSeq, that would have been wonderful. The problem was this data set was, was generated before, before SiteSeq was published. So, so how can we sort of get protein information on this beautiful reference? So we thought what we could do was we could generate our own SiteSeq data set, okay? So we, we went to the, actually the same company that, that HCA used, and, and we generated a data set of 31,000 cells. We don't have human cell atlas money, but it's still a reasonable data set, uh, and 25 accompanying surface proteins, okay? So it's a smaller data set, but it's got RNA and protein together. And we thought now if we can find anchors between the reference data set and, the, and, the, and our small SiteSeq data set, we can effectively transfer the information from the SiteSeq onto the reference. We can effectively impute protein expression in the reference data set. And I want to highlight that when I, when I use the word imputation here, I am not referring to sort of the denoising process that algorithms like MAGIC and others do, where you're sort of trying to smooth the data to recover uh, missing events. Here we're really trying to you know, predict the, something, the, the level of something that we never measured before uh, using a reference data set. So it's a little bit of a different type of imputation. Um, as a result, also, we can test how well this process works by doing sort of, uh, you know, test and training and, and cross-validation. So we actually just took our SiteSeq data set, we divided it in two, we forgot that we measured protein in half of it, and we imputed it back to, to see how accurate we were. Uh, and you can see that we actually have very, very nice predictions across a broad quantitative range for the vast majority of proteins that we look at. Um, but of course, what we're really interested in doing is predicting SiteSeq data in the human cell atlas reference. So this is now the exact same data set I showed you, the same 300,000 cells, but I'm showing you imputed protein levels uh, in each one of those cells for our 25 markers. And this really works extremely well. You can see that we have a very clear T cell population that's uniform for CD3. That bifurcates into either CD4 or CD8 populations. Uh, we can see our CD34 positive cells or our hematopoietic stem cells. You can actually watch that marker sort of decrease as the cells differentiate. It works really, really nicely. Um, and we can also start to see some new signals that we actually hadn't expected. So, so we were surprised that a subpopulation of CD8 T cells, we predicted to have extremely high expression of the surface protein CD69. And there's actually been a lot of debate in the literature and about whether CD69 actually is meaningful in the context of the bone marrow and what genes might be associated with CD69 positive cells. So we have a great data set for that. We can go back and we can ask what genes are higher in that population, and we can discover a really beautiful module here of genes that are highly enriched for cytokines and inflammatory genes, probably driven here by interferon gamma. Uh, and what's nice is uh, we can actually go back to the bone marrow, same cell source of cells, sort CD69 positive pop cells, and then do bulk RNA-seq to validate this result, and we see exactly the same signatures come together. So what I like about this analysis is, is it shows two data sets each of which brings something to the table. So on one hand, you have your, um, on one hand, you have uh, the, the SiteSeq data, which of course has RNA and protein, but on the other hand, you have the human cell atlas data, and that has so many cells that it gives us enormous power to learn these gene signatures. So if we can bring them together uh, and we can integrate them together, uh, that's where we get the greatest bang for our buck. Okay, I'll just show you a couple more examples. Uh, uh, this is actually a, a sort of an interesting extension of this to actually be able to look even across different modalities between RNA-seq and attack-seq data. So, so my lab for a while has been very interested in collaboration with Gord Fischel, who's a neuroscientist, to be able to understand why different interneuron, inhibitory interneuron subsets, how do they choose their fate? So, so single-cell RNA-seq, for example, is great at telling us what the different subsets of differentiated cells are, but it doesn't tell us what the regulators were that actually were responsible for the differentiation. So, so for example, Gordon and I are very interested in what differentiates PV from SST interneurons. They originate from the exact same stem cell population in the brain, uh, but we don't really know why they bifurcate or when they bifurcate. So we thought that the single-cell attack-seq data might give us some information on that, on that question. 
The problem is that when we look at single cell ataxy data, that's much more sparse than single cell RNA. And so we just get sort of one cloud of interneurons. So we can't distinguish the different groups of them from each other like we can in the RNA seq. So we can't do the comparisons that we need. And we reason that if we could, um, if we could sort of anchor the RNA seq and ataxic data sets together, um, we might be able to actually separate these interneurons into multiple populations. And, and in fact, that's exactly what happens. I'm going to have to skip through how we do this a little bit for time. But if effectively, what happens is our, our interneurons that were used to be a single cloud in the ataxic data, the RNA seq sort of guides that analysis. And now we can split that population uh, into four distinct groups, including PV and SST interneurons. And now we can go and ask what's different at the chromatin level between those two populations, which is always what we wanted to do. So, so you know, we want, of course, I'm making a prediction here. Uh, so I have, to be, I have to validate that prediction, especially for this new type of analysis. So what we did was we basically averaged all our predicted PV cells together and averaged all our predicted SST cells together and then tried to find enhancers that were diff different between those two cell types. Um, and when we do that, we get some very comforting results. We see that the canonical loci that we would expect are very, very different between these two cell, type, cell, cell types. That's good. But the real value of this is that we can go genome-wide, and we can ask what motifs are overrepresented in one set of enhancers versus another. And when we do that analysis, what winds up happening is if we look at all the enhancers, the thousands of enhancers that are more accessible in PV cells, there is a single motif that jumps absolutely way to the top of the list, far greater than the second motif, which is for the transcription factor MEF2C. So that, that, that leads us to make a prediction that MEF2C is responsible for the differentiation of PV interneurons. And very comfortingly, when we, when we conditionally knock out MEF2C in the cortex, we get a complete uh, and, and selective uh, 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 ablation of PV interneurons. And, and so, so I like this again because uh, two different data sets are each bringing something to the table. The RNA data set brings us sort of the taxonomic power to, to tell us what are the different types of cells that, that, that are in our tissue. But the chromatin data actually tells us what are the regulators that are responsible for their fate decisions. Um, I, I'll skip through this again for time, but we can do the exact same thing in PBMCs. And again, we can use our RNA data to help us interpret our ataxic data. In this case, this data is all available from 10x genomics. OK, uh, very last example uh, goes back to a, an issue I know we're all excited about, which is thinking about the spatial relationships with which with govern single cells. So, so of course, single cell RNA-seq is amazingly powerful, again, for, for discovering clusters of cells, but it's, it's done on dissociated tissue, so we don't know where any of those cells were located. That's why I'm so excited by these technologies like StarMap or SlideSeq that actually tell us where molecules are and where cells are with relationship to each other. In the context of StarMap, we actually only measure 1,000 genes in the transcriptome, but of course with full spatial resolution. So we thought, all right, well, if we can anchor these two data sets together, then we can do some, maybe some interesting things. So maybe we can impute the expression of all 15,000 genes across the spatial manifold, right? Maybe we can sort of impute spatial-wide, transcriptome-wide spatial patterns in the mouse cortex. And maybe we can also sort of figure out where all of these different cell populations are located uh, in, in the cortex. So those were, those were the two things you wanted to do. So for the first task, we're going to be able to predict uh, a spatial gene expression. Again, we can do a leave one out cross validation. So we sort of forgot that we measured a gene in the star map data set, and then we imputed it back. And I'm showing you our, our measured and predicted uh, uh, imputations here. And you can see that we do, really do quite well. Basically, we can predict the expression of a gene, its spatial pattern, even if we didn't measure that by star map through imputation. Um, in fact, sometimes we're even a little bit cleaner because we're sort of smoothing out some technical noise as well. Now, we were kind of a little bit worried that maybe all we're doing is we're just maybe learning very, very smooth patterns, and maybe this just looks good but isn't actually accurate. But, but if you look carefully either here or in the manuscript, if you look at this gene SST here, somatostatin, um, what you can see is that basically for every single cell where they measured SST, we predict its expression too, really down to the single cell level. And that gives us a lot of confidence that our, that our, our imputations are robust. Um, actually, we can also do the imputation procedure with different uh, technologies. Uh, in, in, in the previous example, I showed you a SmartSeq2 data set. We can try this also in a DropSeq data set in the literature. And again, we see the exact same thing, which is comforting. Uh, we can predict genes and, and new spatial patterns. But the, the very last result that I'll show you is, is that we can also take, uh, now, now that we can draw these anchors, we can ask where, where actually are all of the cell clusters that we learn from single cell RNA-seq, where are those cells actually located in the tissue? Uh, and so this works really nicely. And, it, and it's nice in the context of excitatory cells in the brain because we should know that they, they, they should form this nice laminar structure. Uh, and that's exactly what we see. Uh, and for some, of the, from, for some of the other populations in the brain, it's, it, they're expected to be more scattered, and, and that's what we see as well. But I, I think as these data sets start to grow in size, 
we can really use this type of information to ask how our tissue is structured and how are cellular interactions affecting gene expression, and that's something we're really looking forward to pursuing uh, in my lab. Okay, so with that, I'll, I'll conclude and, and tell you that we've, we've de developed this method uh, to be able to identify anchors, which are pairwise correspondences of cells that we think originate from a similar biological state across data sets. We're particularly excited to use this to develop large harmonized references of RNA-seq experiments across many different labs and many different technologies, um, but also to integrate across modalities and to facilitate the integration of imaging and sequencing data at single cell resolution. Um, all of this uh, code, uh, preprint, uh, vignettes, uh, documentation, and tutorials are all uh, available on my lab website. We have uh, some, some tutorials so you can try out some of these analyses for yourself. Uh, we've already actually had a, the first uh, series of publications that have come out even before our paper is published uh, that have used this tool in the literature, uh, and we'd love for you to, to, to try this and to get in touch if it works well or if it doesn't. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll thank my lab again, in particular Andrew and Tim, uh, and take any questions. Nope. All right. Thank you guys so much.